This is lecture two of unit seven, and we're going to be looking at the state of segregation following Reconstruction. So remember, Reconstruction ends in 1877, so we're going to be looking mostly at the period of 1880s, 1890s. So another social issue that's happening in this Gilded Age leading into the progressive era of reforms. We're going to talk about a little bit about whether or not segregation will actually be dealt with um, by, by the progressive. So in that first chart, just kind of looking at the state of African Americans in the South post, post Civil War, post Reconstruction. Um, so not good. Things aren't things like you had written in your essay didn't change a whole lot. So the life expectancy for the average African American um, was at least 10 years less than the average white American. Um, so again, uh, their health wasn't as good, life was more difficult, more strenuous, and thus um, they could expect to live about 10 years less. Um, the jobs that they could look forward to, generally, we've already talked about, most were stuck in some kind of system of sharecropping, um, that or they were in some kind of domestic service, um, like wait, uh, waiter, uh, wait staff or um, house staff, for example, um, or in menial kind of uh, factory jobs. Um, even though it had become legal to get an education, illiteracy was very high, and in some place, that place some states that ranged from 50 to 70 percent of the African American population was still illiterate, even though it was at that point legal to get an education. Um, and to show how tense things were racially, so obviously segregation, Jim Crow laws are in place, um, but Wilmington, a local example of a North Carolina example of just how tense things were, um, and North Carolina is considered a p particularly liberal state at this time compared to the rest of the South. Um, in 1898, when um, a biracial, so African American and white American, um, city council was elected um, and a, a uh, mayor who supported um, integration um, were, was elected. There then led to this enormous riot and it was really a, a coup d'etat. So um, white supremacists came in, stormed the city, stormed the city council and, and actually took over and managed to kick out um, thousands of African Americans in the process, killing many of them, burning down the black uh, the African-American newspaper. Um, so just a really terrible and horrific example of, even in 1898, many years after the Civil War, how tense things are and how much control and terror white supremacist groups still had. Um, and, and nothing was, was done about, about that, about the white supremacist actions in Wilmington. Um, so again, just another local example of, of how bad things are. This is a very famous race riot. Um, and you'll be reading a little bit about it for homework um, by the same author of Blood Done Sign My Name, if you've read, if you've read that in English. So, um, the biggest issue facing African Americans uh, was lynching in the South. Um, and again, you've already looked at postcards of this during the Reconstruction Unit, um, but how many? There's probably roughly the estimate. These things aren't. Um, there were very few records of this sort of thing happening, um, but there are about a thousand a year. Um, and the height of lynching actually comes in the 1920s when racism is actually at its worst and the KKK is at its at its largest membership. Um, and the who is generally 90% of lynchings um, were African American. Um, African Americans, but about 10% were other people. Um, for example, immigrants, um, Catholics, Jews, um, anyone who wasn't a white American uh, Protestant. But again, so 90% African American, um, and then the other 10% may or 10% would be immigrants, Jews, Catholics, or people that were maybe helping African Americans. So white Americans who were helping um, African Americans. Um, and like the notes say, these things were very public events. You can see here there's children, there are children watching this. Um, this one's on a bridge in broad daylight. Um, this one you can see hundreds of town folk have turned out for this particular lynching. Um, so these were public events. People used to take picnics to them and like you saw, the ones, the pictures you were looking at were postcards. So people actually um, bought pictures or bought postcards of these events and would send them as greeting cards like 
hi, how are you? I think that there was one postcard, if you look through that without sanctuary site that was, you know, asking um, so about someone's aunt or uncle and just how they're doing. And on the front is a picture of lynching. And it's just particularly morbid, but shows you just how widespread and accepted this activity um, was. Um, and the really terrible part about this is that they, the people who were lynched had not actually committed any kind of crime. Um, they would usually, like I said, the uh, white supremacists usually used um, sexual tension to uh, kind of drive um, their cause and talking about protecting the virginity and the purity of, of white women in the South. Um, so they usually falsely accuse these people of raping um, a daughter or a, a wife or sexually harassing them or looking at them, whistling at them, things like that. Um, but really what they were being lynched for was maybe there, maybe it was an African American who owned a business that was in competition for a white business or maybe an African American male tried to vote um, or tried to run for office um, or teachers for example those sorts of things. So anytime they were seen as a threat to the white establishment, um, lynching was something that you frequently saw as a quote-unquote punishment, and again, they would usually the white supremacists would come up with some fake charge, some fake crime, but clearly no trial was ever held um, for these lynchings. Um, and so Ida B. Wells is the journalist that actually tries to expose this. Kind of, you think about Harriet Beecher Stowe was the, the writer who exposed how bad slavery was to the North. Um, many in the nation were not aware that lynching was happening. And so Ida B. Wells tries, mostly unsuccessfully, but she tries to expose just how horrific the situation is in Jim Crow South, and especially with lynching. Um, so talking about segregation very quickly. So remember that the court case that said that segregation was constitutional was Plessy versus Ferguson, and that was a case of uh, a wealthy African-American man who tried to travel in first class, um, and he was told that he could not, and so he sued, even though he could buy the ticket. And so this is where the Supreme Court eventually ruled um, that as long as the facilities were equal, that they could be segregated. And so that's where you see um, the segregation of water fountains, of schools. Um, so you had different, obviously, white schools and black schools, but clearly they weren't equal. The African-American schools, if they had textbooks at all, were used, old used textbooks from white schools. They didn't always have the best teachers. They didn't have the best facilities, the best um, resources. So that's, that was leading to um, some of that low literacy that we talked about earlier. Factories were segregated, so they would have white assembly lines and black assembly lines in entertainment very famously, and you'll see this when you go on the field trip um, in about May for the Civil Rights Tour, that theaters were segregated. So the African Americans sat in far back in the balcony or in the back of the theater, whites sat in the front. Um, generally, African Americans had to buy their tickets in a different place. Transportation, um, trains at this time were, were the main transportation. Those were seg segregated into white and black train cars um, in the future. You famously know about buses being segregated, the train stations were segregated, restaurants were segregated. Usually um, restaurants either would say they were white only, or if African Americans came, they had a separate window and a door that they had to go through, and they weren't allowed to sit, they just had to buy their food um, and then leave, so they could only stand, they weren't allowed to sit. So again, everything segregated, and um, again, just horrific rules um, about this. And then, so on top of the lynching and the segregation, there was the disenfranchisement. Enfranchisement is um, granting the right to vote. And so remember, that was supposed to be granted to all men, um, all American men, with the 15th Amendment. Um, but remember that um, the 15th Amendment was worded in such a way that it said that voting could not be denied based on race. Um, and could not be denied based on income, couldn't be denied based on religion, but it didn't say it couldn't be de denied based on other things. And so this is how the South gets around the 15th Amendment, is it doesn't deny it based on race. Um, it denies it based on literacy, for example. So again, the law said that it couldn't deny it on race. So how they disenfranchised is they would charge poll taxes, and so that you had to pay 
to vote, um, and, and most African Americans in the South were quite poor and couldn't afford it. Um, they had to pass a literacy test, which you'll see in class, uh, which was quite difficult. And again, like I said, most African Americans were illiterate um, at that time and could not read um, to vote. Um, and then there was also something known as the grandfather clause, and this was that if your grandfather could vote, you could vote. Now at this time, we're in the 1880s, most African American men, their grandfather would have been uh, enslaved, and thus they could not vote. So there's sort of the three main ways that we saw African Americans disenfranchised. Um, so there's kind of two main schools of thought of how to deal with um, the segregation, the lynching, and the disenfranchisement. Um, we have W.E.B. Du Bois on the left, and then Booker T. Washington here on the right. So two very different ideas um, of what to do, and this is what we will be debating in class. So W.E.B. Du Bois, his philosophy was that um, African Americans needed to fight for their civil rights. They had been granted them in the 14th and 15th Amendment and with the Civil Rights Acts of the 60s and 70s, and thus they needed to demand them and fight strongly for them. Um, as background, W.E.B. Du Bois was the first African-American man to graduate or get a, a PhD from Harvard. He was highly educated. Um, and so it was coming from, kind of from that mentality. He had lived up in the North. Um, he had seen how things were different. And again, um, coming from that mentality and a very educated um, background and saying that African-Americans need to be um, have all the same opportunities to get to wealth, to get to PhDs in education that any white person had. And so what he starts is the Niagara Movement, and this is a movement promoting this and trying to fight for, usually using the political means and, um, and writing, trying to get um, African Americans their, their rights. Um, and, and from this comes the NAACP, which we have today, but again, Du Bois is part of the beginnings of, of that group of the NAACP. On the other hand, you've got Booker T. Washington. Booker T. Washington was born into slavery, so he's coming from a very different perspective. Um, and his philosophy was kind of to, to gradually get rights. Um, he saw that power came from economic power, political power came from economic power. Think about the Gilded Age and the wealthy monopolists, that those guys who control the Senate. So he saw, and what he felt, was that African Americans needed to take baby steps and first gain economic power and respect, and thus would then win political rights and political respect. Um, that it was too much and too dangerous to try to demand rights immediately. Um, and so he famously gives a speech in what is known as the Atlanta Compromise, and Booker T. Washington is about compromise. He's, um, and some people see him as a sellout for this, that he was um, kind of compromising with the racists, with the white supremacists, saying um, that African Americans needed to kind of take a step back, not demand political rights immediately and fight for them, but to really focus on um, bringing themselves up and empowering themselves economically first before trying to demand any rights. And, and as a kind of to practice what he's preaching, he formed what is known as the Tuskegee Institute. It's now Tuskegee University today, but at the time Tuskegee Institute. And this trained African American men um, and women in technical skills. So um, there were there was a part of it that was training servants, for example, and teachers. Um, it was there was a part training in, in more technical skills. Um, any all sorts of different um, kind of middle class, lower class technical skills in factories and farming, mechanical and um, sort of engineering sort of things. So again, trying to build up a lower and a strong middle class, and they even taught things like like hygiene and, and teeth brushing. Because he, when he first was um, freed and then was uh, working with a white family to become literate and kind of building himself up, himself up. One of the first things he really learned about after enslavement was kind of the power of, of hygiene and kind of being well kept and how that brought you respect and about the power of toothbrush, teeth brushing. And he actually wrote extensively on this about just kind of teaching freed men just how to brush your teeth and how much of a difference that made in your life. And again, um, it was, he was really, this kind of demonstrates that he was really like 
look, before we start talking about getting PhDs and running for Senate, we have to teach the majority of African Americans um, to live as freed men and to, to build themselves up economically, get them out of sharecropping debt, um, get them out of these bad contracts and, and empower them to um, have businesses and have kind of live a middle class lifestyle and then start talking about rights. So these are again, like I said, two very different philosophies when we're talking about which um, was the, the wisest one to kind of join with. So lots of people joined both sides supported both kind of leaders, and um, we'll see what you guys think in class. That's it for today. <laughs>